Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. The Chinese rocket forces, in my opinion, my little humble opinion, I'm not a military expert, let me just put a disclaimer right there, is one of the biggest credible threats that I see that the Chinese pose in terms of a war fighting effort against India, or for that matter, any other country. We need to understand this threat. We need to understand what they have, what are their capabilities. What do we have and what are our capabilities? Can we counter this Chinese threat and can we also pose a credible threat to China? To discuss this, I have with me Air Marshal Baby, who is going to help us understand this game of rockets. Sir, good evening and welcome to the show. Thank you, Ali. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Sir, as I said, I find the Chinese rocket forces to be one of the major threats. And this is not something which is... Uh, my opinion, I think this has been spoken about by a lot of people around the world. Ki bhai, Chinese ka, one of the things which is really strong are the rocket forces. The kind of systems they've got and the kind of uh, rockets that they carry is, is very credible. Uh, firstly, sir, let's understand this credible threat that the Chinese have and uh, further dig into what they have, sir. Yes, uh, of course, Adi. You see, firstly, to uh, begin with your title, you know, uh, what I saw, say whose rocket force is better, but that I guess the time will tell. But uh, it's a fair to make an, uh, a reasonable or I would say an informed uh, study of the rocket force, what they have and what we can have. So between India and China, I would say, I mean, I when I rethink now, the more apt title or the more uh, not apt title, I mean, the more apt question to ask is whose rocket force can get better? Because we have just kind of started on that uh, page. Now, as we all know, the PLA, you know, rocket force uh, is now uh, just giving a broad, I will, what I'll do is I'll just move from broader area to a little narrow area so that we understand the whole uh, thing. Uh, it is like a separate force now. You know, it, it's like Army, Navy, uh, Air Force, and there is a rocket force, which uh, came into being classically uh, on 1st of January 2016. You know, from the earlier uh, when it was called Second Artillery. Okay. So I think that is when this uh, whole thing was re-Christianed. And, uh, you know, then uh, there was a lot of talk of uh, theater com commands, you know, this theater, that theater. I mean, general reorganization of... Uh, China, it came into uh, prominence. People started to taking a, a big note of uh, this particular uh, aspect. Now, when we talk of second artillery, uh, you see how did second artillery start? Now, China, uh, if we see, went nuclear in 64, October 64 to be precise. And now they were wondering how, what to do with this rocket, uh, we did this nuclear force, how to deliver it. So in 1966, the uh, second artillery uh, force was formed with the sole responsibility to deliver nuclear warheads. It had no other uh, role. And they did it very, very uh, in a focused manner. Uh, you know, in 77, they created uh, one rocket force command college, you know, to train specifically people uh, for this kind of uh, missile system. They have had uh, till now about 30,000 cadets uh, in that train and which has produced about 40 plus generals. So th that means their focus was exactly like we in the army, you know, we have artillery school or if you talk of air force, it has tag D, you know, these are our core activities and we have the training institutions for that. So this would show that China from that time itself had a focus on uh, this side. So they created that rocket force uh, command college. Okay. Now, down the line, I guess, you know, while they were focusing all the development, we will talk of individual missiles a, a little later, carried on somewhere uh, down the line, you know, in 1980s. Probably they must have happened when, you know, South China Sea or American forces became apparent that they probably couldn't, uh, uh, you know, match uh, America or Russia aircraft to aircraft. You know, that if they had to take on their targets, then what was the alternative? The alternative was long-range missile, but all the long-range missiles were nuclear for nuclear purpose. So that is when in the 1980s, the CMC gave uh, directions, the Central Military Commission, that it must have dual role. So they came up with this, uh, what is called uh, a second artillery campaign doctrine. 
okay hmm. in uh, and this doctrine was of dual deterrence and dual operations you know the uh, cmc itself directed that now onwards the missiles must have a dual role and uh, uh, i will just quote that exact statement uh, which said that nuclear missile force deterrence actions and conventional missile strike operations must be fused together and mutually interwoven unquote so this is where they started mixing up the uh, two even till today they do not have differentiation in command and control who holds the uh, nuclear uh, missiles or who holds the conventional missiles but it suffices to say that overall you know they have if you see their overall structure of missile force uh, six bases there are nine bases but we exclude one which is holding some stockpile or some training or some maintenance there are you know it's a very straightforward mathematics they have six bases uh, which hold the missiles which control the missiles and each base has got about six to eight brigades there are total 40 brigades which they have uh, you know which hold missiles and each brigade has about six to eight battalions so it's a straightforward that kind of distribution and now with this doctorate you know doctrine they they have you know there are various figures from 2200 somewhere 2500 some may be hidden so let's say 3000 missiles also i mean you know just as a broad guess okay 80% of that today is towards conventional effort so it's about 350 320 somewhere it says 320 somewhere 350 is the warhead the nuclear warhead loaded uh, i mean uh, capable missiles otherwise capable are all what i mean to say that many missiles are catering for nuclear warheads and the nuclear others have conventional uh, warheads because they realize that they will have to take on uh, targets especially ships in the uh, you know ocean uh, if they have to uh, strike or especially the targets in guam let's say etc etc okay so this is how uh, it, it started now the categories when we come to uh, their missiles is uh, you know let's uh, there are short range ballistic missiles okay which we say less than 1000 kilometers uh, of range a df15 classically uh, falls into that okay then you come medium range ballistic missiles which were which is between 1000 to 3000 kilometers let's say df16 and df21 21 classically you know which is which should be our biggest worry there's got five variants a b c d uh, for different reasons we will see and then intermediate range and intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles more than 5500 kilometers range going up to 12000 or 17000 kilometers uh, df31 41 they fall into uh, this category their program started with df5 precisely you know with 12 15000 kilometers range like i said for nuclear warhead but in today's mm-hmm. scenario uh, these kind of these missiles which we said are important and people generally talk about uh, this in addition what you know unfortunately or surprisingly doesn't get much focus in the normal is their cruise missiles okay the ground launch cruise missile cj10 what they call and the air launched version you know cj20 or some where it's written yj20 okay that that is uh, what is very very important we'll see why that is uh, important and then of course the much uh, touted the uh, hypersonic uh, glide vehicle df17 which is predated uh, now and then and it says that china is much ahead of usa also uh, in the hypersonic uh, mm. arena uh, we mm-hmm. will see how to that is yeah now on the, the df series i mean just as a common uh, knowledge you know dong feng it stands for which means east wind and they're all you know cj is some chang jian which means long sword so and so uh, fourth you know they have these uh, prefixes now what i want to tell is that these are ballistic missiles okay what is the problem with ballistic missile how ballistic missile function is that it is launched you know from a particular uh, ground base it uh, leaves atmosphere okay uh, goes into 80 100 150 even 200 kilometers height some of them depending on what height they have to go to and they are taken by a rocket by a booster you know initially there used to be liquid propulsions uh, and now that we are changing our I mean the world is changing to solid uh, propellant Uh, you know initially solid propellant uh, you know was uh, people were careful or rather uh, apprehensive about that because it's a grain which it forms they had to be very very carefully handled and if there was any crack in that or something 
Now it would burst. Plus liquid fuel you could control better, etc. But uh, uh, it takes time to prepare a liquid uh, fuel engine, whereas uh, rocket, you know, is uh, readily used, uh, usable, mm -hmm. like your Diwali mm -hmm. rocket, frankly. Okay, it is like that. But all of us know that in case uh, there is a problem with that uh, Diwali rocket or its, uh, you know, grain, then it can burst in your hand also. Okay, yes, that is simplifying the issue. But what I'm saying initially, those were the uh, problems. But now technology is improving. So most of them are solid fuel uh, propellant. It could be single stage, double stage, depending on how much range you uh, want to cover. Okay. Now, these ballistic missiles, how did they travel to their target? They basically went on inertial navigation. Okay. Initial CP of the missiles was some 600 to 700 meters because we all know that inertial navigation is prone to drift. Even when you fly uh, an aircraft, you know, like Mirage 2000, you flew which earlier version only had inertial navigation system. You had to update the system frequently with a fixed ground uh, feature. Otherwise, oh, your drift yeah. would be tar targets or, you know, features on the way you go for navigation. You know a particular, uh, you know, feature, a bridge that it is there and these are its coordinates. So you updated and told the system, look, uh, this is the place, you know, uh, the correct coordinates which so it updated itself. Otherwise, it could uh, bring in errors to as much as, you know, one nautical mile uh, in, in a uh, few hours. Okay. That is a wow. kind of, that, that is, that is a simple navigation system, you know, standard gyros. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But what happened is then, then there were improvement in gyros. Okay. The ring laser gyros came, you know, where there are no moving parts and there is a laser which is used uh, to, uh, you know, do the same purpose or the measure, uh, the rotations, etc. Now, uh, what happens is with these improvements, the CPs uh, improved. But why didn't these ballistic missiles uh, employ any kind of uh, terrestrial navigation, like you no know, GPS guidance, I would say. Probably they were not uh, in those uh, years when we are talking of uh, not very easy to do. But I think uh, even when you see American missile, Trident uh, 5, you know, the nuclear uh, missile, uh, which they had 12,000, 15,000 kilometers range, had only inertial navigation system. I feel they had a little issue or little feeling that, uh, you know, moment you equip this missile, which is responding to an external signal, and it is with a nuclear warhead, there is a possibility that it can be, you know, taken elsewhere or misguided. So it should not have any external influence whatsoever. May, uh, I'm sorry to interject, sir, but may I ask you something for this very subject? Yeah. Uh, for a nuclear weapon, sir, uh, delivery in terms of accuracy is not really... Not really important. Precisely. Okay. That is why they did not really bother. Okay. Bother about. I was just coming to that. Yeah. 600 to 700 meters accuracy was good enough. Okay. Yeah. So they did not bother about it. That it's after all detonating a nuclear head. Okay, Correct. so it was okay, and there was no requirement to update it to uh, that an extent. Okay, but even subsequently, uh, you know, when uh, uh, when we say now that uh, the accuracy is improved, even DF twenty one, take an example, you know, which is uh, uh, DF twenty one A or the original A when it came up, it, it had like we said six hundred to seven hundred meters accuracy. Then subsequently, C versions, D version, B version, they all improved accuracy. And now they say 30 to 50 meters. I presume now, even when you search literature, how have they improved this uh, accuracy? Is uh, probably with more defined or more modified gyros, okay? Like ring laser gyros, etc. There is not terminal guidance available, you know, like there is no uh, final uh, RF seeker or optical seeker or uh, something like that. Now, when this uh, accuracy is given, okay, even if it is GPS, IN GPS kind of, uh, 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 you know, combination, this is CEP, you know, CEP is 30 to 50 meters. Now, what is the concept of CEP? CEP is circular error probable, you know, how it was actually applicable for conventional kind of uh, weapons, you know, how it worked, they say 50% of the weapons fall within this much, uh, uh, this much uh, range. Like I fire, I have a target, you know, a pin and I fire 100 bombs, okay? I fire 100 or drop 100 bombs over that or fire 100 rockets uh, over that pin. And now I go and see on the ground where have those bombs or rockets fallen. So I start the from the target pattern. I start from the target, one, two, three, four, and I keep going outwards and I stop at 50. 
from there i draw a line a range to my uh, target and say whatever it measures let's say 20 meters i said cp of this bomb is 20 meters but now you had to have a great sample for that right to do this kind yeah. of exercise yeah. and like yeah. in the squadrons in you know we dropped i don't know how many hundreds of bombs or thousands of bombs so you you can have you can also say cp of this squadron is 20 meters you know cp of this man is like you know i i can have my own sample and i say that i fired 100 bombs and i you know maximum 50 of them have always fallen within 10 yards so i can always claim that my cp is 10 meters you know so it is that kind of concept now with these missiles which cost you anywhere between 3 to 5 million dollars or maybe more you can't fire hundreds of them you know you do test uh, missile you know every missile which is fired uh, basically is tested when we pronounce it's a success, you know, that so and so fire was successful, means all its components functioned the way they were supposed to function and it went and hit the intended target, okay, and everything was within uh, tolerance, that is what it is said, okay. Now, what exact uh, distance is achieved, etc., is, you know, will never really be published. And thus, this calculation that how accurate it is, mostly dependent on your scientific and mathematical models because they tell you that okay if this is uh, this is the component it has got this accuracy it does not cater for real conditions it does not cater for your uh, you know it, it assumes that your launch conditions were perfect your atmospheric conditions are perfect there is no deviation on the way and your re-entry conditions are also uh, perfect you know nothing happens and if i have to draw an analogy with this you know you let's say you have wheels you have a car okay uh, whose wheels are aligned properly steering locked i mean nothing happens okay you leave it from a to b by measuring line and you know how closely it hits the target is how perfectly its wheels are aligned right Understood. now yeah. Now what happens is if I find that it is always landing up 100 meters to the left or right. Now I know that right. its wheel or mm. wheels are somewhere going wonky to the left. So I realign it. And now I run it on spool and I mathematically or scientifically measure their alignment. And I say, okay, it's not going more than, you know, one milli radian off in uh, 10 minutes. So I can now uh, calculate that, okay, accuracy of this car now hitting the target will be within 10 meters. I do not cater for any kind of gust. I do not cater for any abnormality in the road, which may just bump it off to one side, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And when we say update on the way like GPS update, now if you had a driver sitting inside who was blindfolded initially, and occasionally you opened its eyes, you know, to see where is it going and he made some correction. So that is what GPS update does. You know, it is not continuously going by GPS in between, you know, because they can't afford to have probably a seeker always looking uh, at update. So they feel that by the time inertial nav is likely to go off, uh, it must get one GPS uh, update. Okay. So the thing is that the uh, these kind of accuracies, what it, what it demands, is 30 to 50 uh, meters of uh, accuracy is probably with GPS kind of uh, update. Okay. Now, uh, you know, another uh, uh, understanding what uh, comes is that, uh, oh, they are maneuverable, you know, that they can maneuverable or maneuverable re entry vehicles, you know, they are equipped with that. Now, why does a ballistic missile maneuver? Ballistic missile does not maneuver in uh, relation to a threat or in relation to a uh, what should I say, a correction, uh, you know, uh, uh, as given by a terminal seeker because its speed is too high. All ballistic missiles go, you know, up to 10, 15, 16, 20 marks also. And they enter and after re-entry, they start slowing down and ultimately hit the target at about Mark 3 generally. You know, unless they are boosted, like when we talk of hypersonic missiles. This is ballistic on its own. You know, it has been uh, a, given that initial velocity, whatever uh, it had to be. The concept of maneuvering started, uh, you know, the trajectory of the ballistic missile could be uh, predicted. So what happens is like the example I gave of car. Okay, it started from a point, you know, it has started from here, it, it can only go there. Now, when you had to intercept this missile, you cannot catch it. You had to put uh, your interceptor in the way of the ballistic missile. It is the ballistic missile which came and hit the interceptor, not the other way. Okay. Now, if I switch my example to, let's say, a, an athlete on the track, 
ओके टेक उसेन बोल्ट और बाई उसेन बोल्ट आर ओन होम ग्रोन एथलीट पी टी उषा लेट से मीटर ट्रैक ओके नाउ यू हैव टू इंटरसेप्ट यू कॉन्ट कैच हर यू यू कॉन्ट फॉलो हर एंड कैच हर यू विल हैव टू पोजिशन यूर सेल्फ इन हर वे राइट सो दैट शी इज ऑन ए पर्टिकुलर ट्रैक लेट से शी डिड नॉट डिविएट यू नो यू नो शी स्टार्ट फ्रॉम देयर and after some time she is bound to reach here because her trajectory is predicted she is on a track so i position my interceptor on the way that she has no other way to go and hit that and that is how it got intercepted so that the solution to that was to make it maneuverable at a in between point somewhere right so let's say at 200 meters she changed track so now i couldn't predict from the beginning that where is she likely to land right or where is this ballistic missile not likely to land so that is what is uh, maneuvering you know there could be one skip like uh, glide vehicles you know they can skip once twice etc okay so this is what is meant primarily by maneuvering uh, missile when they correct their trajectory there are thrusters etc but what we want classically or what is referred to as maneuvering by an air to air missile or a cruise missile is very different you know they can maneuver with aerodynamic uh, uh, wings and now when we talk of df21 when they say that it is maneuverable i believe when it is revealed they some controls control surfaces were uh, noticed okay uh, that they it is probably they are for doing uh, its maneuvering or correcting the uh, trajectory so very small corrections can be done probably with respect to uh, gps upgrade but if it had to maneuver with respect to terminal guidance it will be very difficult uh, kind of thing that is why the cruise missiles are in the uh, market because though their speed is less you know most of them except for brahmos when we come to that you know generally there are subsonic cruise missiles okay even the cj10 of china is a, a copy of tomahawk missile exactly mm-hmm. what tomahawk does is the cj10 does okay but you know 1500 kilometers range subsonic by all means but see what it has for precision you know the uh, terrain contour mapping that turcom it wow. has you know uh, dismac the digital scene matching you know all these kind of uh, you know things are uh, uh, there uh, in this particular missile that means she can actually have pinpoint accuracy okay much more deadly then a missile which you know even if the accuracy is uh, 30 to 50 meters uh, we, we i i can definitely uh, put a another uh, some factor of degradation that it cannot be pinpoint now what is the efficacy of this why i mean I, it's not just to put down a missile they are very potent missiles it is that they will have to fire more number of them i mean you know it is not uh, that one missile against one target as we tend to feel that okay one target has to be destroyed one df20 or df15 will come and it will blast the hell out of it it probably may not be the case much more number uh, will be uh, required now when we just quickly uh, switch to uh, what we say uh, our you know in our rocket force are uh, you know before uh, uh, going any further on china side the uh what happens is uh, like we said we we just started on integrated rocket force now i i think we must have been under pressure to give some kind of uh, to match china in because this rocket force was creating uh, uh concern so we said okay we will also have uh, rocket force so there are two elements to it integrated and rocket force integrated uh, because uh, it's more of command and control and not really integration of rockets per se you know mm. it's not different kind of rockets which are going to be integrated to form some kind of layer defense you know it's not that it is only command and control because now we have sfc you know we have our nuclear arsenal completely under sfc and all uh, three uh, services have sir, the, sfc most lot of people won't know uh, the form okay this is our strategic force command you know one of the tri services command uh, uh, which was created uh, which holds all the strategic uh, assets you know like agni uh, class of missiles and initially prithvi class of missiles or any other missile okay now uh, what happens is when uh, this integrated when comes to command and control i don't know whether they are going to put all these missiles under this strategic force command or they will create a, a another parallel structure like our other agencies you know like defense space agency or cyber agency 
uh, so similarly there could be an integrated rocket force under ids you know or integrated defense staff uh, etc etc that will probably come or like there is a talk of theater command if that comes up something uh, may be uh, put under uh, that okay hmm. but you see now there is a difference the difference is we trace the history of uh, china you know starting from 66 and uh, you know coming uh, various landmarks and dedicated focus now what happened uh, uh, in our case two differences you know while china was competing or catering for america and russia we were generally focused on pakistan so the our requirements were entirely different where china felt the need to hit 5000 kilometers with conventional missile or 3000 kilometers with conventional missile till quite late i don't think we really felt the need uh, of that you know to or that, uh, that yeah. to go that far our introduction of you know air to air refueling capability etc is a kind of uh, you know testimony that uh, what kind of aspirations we had so similarly our development probably was focused uh, on uh, uh, from that point of view we created uh, a, a cell called swtt special weapons development uh, uh, you know point or uh, something t uh, i forget uh, a swtt uh, development something okay I'll, i'll tell you what is it uh, 1958 it was created team special weapon development team okay which later on changed in 1961 to uh, drdl at uh, uh, delhi and finally moved in 62 to hyderabad its present location and our uh, you know uh, 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 program started in 72 with project devil you know what was the devil devil was a missile uh, s75 of russia actually which was now uh, the origin of prithvi you know when we started our in igmdb what we call integrated missile development program which started in 1983 it had five missiles primarily okay that is trishul uh, nag uh, prithvi and agni out of them which concern us uh, as of now trishul akash nag and prithvi and agni so prithvi was one of uh, that missile okay so it is 1983 that we started looking on uh, this program okay prithvi to begin with there was a liquid propulsion and like i said you know while uh, we borrowed that s75 or russian technology we did not get into solid because while they were using solid uh, fueled version in uh, russia we felt that you know transporting the solid uh, rocket or solid grain from russia to the uh, climate of india it may not behave well so we did not take chance till we really improved on technology now subsequent mm-hmm. version of prithvi now are going to be solid fueled uh, right now prithvi missile uh, uh, you know was developed for a particular purpose and you know it had ranges 150 kilometers to 500 kilometers depending on its warhead and the service it was with army had 150 tactical ballistic missile actually and it it had uh, 150 kilometers range with 1000 kg warhead then if you reduce the warhead to 500 kg it went to 350 kilometers there was a 500 kilometer version also then with indian navy it was called dhanush so on and so forth it stayed with us okay and there was also a prithvi a defense version you know which was for uh, ballistic uh, missile defense which could intercept a ballistic missile at 80 kilometers and now there is an advanced ad version uh, which is uh, you know uh, coming up i mean as per the gen right now uh, agni series you know we have agni 1 to 5 okay they are purely strategic and depending on you know the ranges have only uh, improved so i don't think they come into uh, our feature as of now because they are not meant for uh, conventional and actually no point having a missile for that long for a conventional uh, strike unless you have an improved guidance or improved precision capability on that because and the then, size of carrying capability yeah, as well the size of care carrying capability as well because now no point you know delivering a 200 kg of warhead you know 10000 kilometers away some 500 <laughs> meters off the target right so that is why the uh, this this uh, particular thing becomes important now other versions of this prithvi uh, is you know various uh, prahar pragati pranash you know you go on the net they will pralay. all of this mm-hmm. pralay is different okay pralay uh, pralay is a different uh, uh, missile i'm just talking of modifications on prithvi okay or or this uh, on the solid fuel between 170 to 200 kilometers of range 
Now, Pralay is SRSPM kind of thing, you know, so short, short range ballistic missile, about 500 kilometers range as of now. Recently uh, tested and launched, and you know, uh, it was in the induction. news that uh, government has cleared that induction is coming. You know, 120 were contracted earlier. I believe 250 uh, are, are being uh, bored. So, solid fuel uh, propellant. And also, I think uh, so far, uh, you know, it will have. Uh, it, it definitely every missile will have inertial nav uh, system, improved versions, you know, improved laser gyros, uh, etc. You know, another reason why these missiles, these uh, very high speed missiles, did not have these uh, seekers. One is like nuclear uh, thing that we uh, talked about, that they uh, did not require that kind of accuracy. Another problem came that, you know, these seekers are very sensitive. The kind of Mach number they went to, the kind of kinetic heating, the re-entry temperatures, etc. It was very cumbersome to have these sensitive sensors of, on the uh, missiles. Okay. That is where the uh, cruise missiles came into being. They, they stay low. They are, you know, turbofan uh, 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 propelled. And they can go long way as long as you carry fuel. And they can, you know, they also have uh, various guidance systems. They have radio altimeters. They have, uh, like I said, TERCOM kind of uh, facility. And now coming to our uh, BrahMos. You know, BrahMos incidentally, I think, was the world's first supersonic cruise missile. Okay. Its range earlier was 290 kilometers restricted because of MTCR uh, issues. You know, they could not uh, uh, export a version with higher range. But now I think the ranges are being increased uh, to 400 kilometers. We have an air launched version also. Okay, air launched version means you can have as much range as you uh, want now. Okay, but if the ground missile can go 400 kilometers, uh, then the air launched version will definitely go higher because it has got initial Perfect. boost it has got uh, initial i mean i am not talking of only that aircraft has carried it far to begin with it is that it is uh, mm -hmm. uh, it has got initial speed you know initial uh, in our equation of uh, inertia is, inertia uh, is already uh, there is already there so it will give you a little more uh, range, range okay? yes. Range, but the, see the beauty of uh, Brahmos is that it has got end seeker. You know, it has RF seeker. It has got IN GPS. GPS updates continue. It has two modes. You know, IN GPS mode and RF seeker mode. Okay. Now, if you have to strike a moving ship, let's say in the sea, you need some kind of terminal guidance. You know, you cannot uh, just purely work on IN GPS. You know that because if that ship has moved or something, they presume. That when they launch, uh, you know, a uh, ballistic missile onto a ship of DF-21 class and it's purely going on the accurate uh, laser uh, gyro or GPS update. GPS update is not on the target incidentally. It's not giving you update on the target. It's giving you your own update that, okay, your inertial nav says this, but GPS coordinates are this. So it corrects itself that, okay, no, I'm not here, I'm here. Okay, so later on trajectory is corrected with a minor thrusters and, uh, you know, minor uh, maneuverings. It cannot chase a target. You know, it's not that if a target starts maneuvering, it can go and follow that uh, target. That kind of capability will not be there in any ballistic design. Okay. And there is no ground link, as we know. So there is no operation happening on the missile. It is unlike, you know, some missiles which are talking back to the operator or to the aircraft, you know, where the system is continuously designated and updated. This does not happen with, uh, you know, uh, this kind of missile. Then uh, we, we, you know, another uh, Nirbhaya class of missile, uh, we had, it, it had some problems to begin with, but I believe things are settled down. It will give you 1500 kilometers uh, range. Okay. Now, all in all, when we see our uh, arsenal, firstly, we started uh, way behind. Okay. Now, when we talk, can we take on Chinese rocket force and all? It is not, I don't think it is going to be rocket over rocket. You know, it is not, it is not like those, uh, like it is not that we have developed an anti-rocket force, okay, that can we take on China's rocket force. These are two individual rocket forces. They will do their individual job. How will they create deterrence is that if we create, it is the, it will be like nuclear deterrence. What is nuclear deterrence? Nuclear bombs are not going to fight each other in the air, right? Mm -hmm. Nuclear deterrence is that if this guy launches nuclear deterrence, a nuclear weapon, then the other guy has got an equally potent nuclear weapon to harm you. So the, uh, for which we need to create our rocket force is to create that deterrence that if, if nothing else happens, let's say there is no other dimension of war. There is no aircrafts involved. There is no ground forces involved. And it is only rocket force. 
that brings me you know why did they name it rocket it actually behaved like just a rocket you know it was fire and forget missile so they said it's it's more like a rocket you know you just launch it thereafter forget about it it way it will go wherever you have i mean hope like hell it goes correctly because you have no control over it you you are not guiding it sitting here you are not designating the target you are not doing anything so it's more like a rocket you know was gone but now the technology is different i mean you know it waves like a missile so we are saying that so what happens is the if you create that deterrence that you have an enough arsenal what we need in uh, you know my fair uh, judgment is that while we we need to be conscious of the uh, you know pla rocket force it's not that we give up we need to have credible defense we are already uh, taking care of that okay but to create deterrence we need more number we need more range and we need precision now you can uh, let's say convert agni into uh, you know conventional like they did or their nuclear uh, with, uh, missiles with conventional warhead but if if we convert this agni into conventional i don't know what kind of purpose beyond 1000 or 1500 kilometers range it will serve whether it will uh, go to the correct place or not so unless we have that accuracy you know uh, built in into that it will not serve its desired uh, purpose so we need to invest more on a brahmos class of missile you know they've already promised that the range will be 600 kilometers it can go hypersonic etc etc so that is the technology i think we we need to uh, build in that is uh, that is what the, where the world is going you know now even when we talk of america they are uh, struggling they are not getting into this uh, uh, ballistic missile uh, race that you know how fast and how mm. far can you hit it's more on precision lockheed martin is building a precision strike missile for them okay and there that you know there is a, a new Uh, uh, joint they call it joint air to surface standoff missile er 1000 kilometers uh, range okay they are going into air launched cruise missile so everything is with precision so mm. even in hypersonics you know vehicles when you say that speed etc etc they are not uh, much interested in how fast can you go they are uh, uh, interested in uh, how precise can you be at those ranges so in my opinion you know this is sometimes when we uh, they make a statement that china is far ahead in the race of hypersonics from us i think us is running a different race it's not even that uh, in that uh, race you know that you go very fast and you go uh, very far and but not sure where is it uh, going okay so from indian rocket force and chinese rocket force you know i've uh, tried to just paint a picture of what ballistic missiles uh, can do and china has a lot lot of area to cover you know it's a taiwan it's a usa focused it will have decent number of missiles against india i'm not at all uh, saying that launch bases and their mobile uh, you know uh, launchers are there they can uh, move from here to uh, there wherever and what we need to do is i need to be focused on my target on my uh, vital area vital point not from where he launches the missile if ultimately it's going to come over my target so i am not uh, uh, you know bothered about destroying his launch position so i should track his mobile tracker everywhere i am bothered about missile which is coming over uh, me so uh, defense you know s400 or different defenses that we build up uh, i think uh, drdl they are working on this advanced ad etc uh, the solutions will be there but uh, ground deterrence will be created by having more number of decent range missiles with accuracy now if you develop 1000 to 1500 kilometers of range which has some kind of guidance and some kind of you know uh, terminal um, accuracy and is fairly fast enough even if not mark 5 6 even if mark 2 3 in my opinion it, it will be good amount of uh, deterrence so this is what i feel is the uh, equation say so my piece whatever time it took uh, go ahead whatever now you have in mind i'm sorry i'm just i think i'm catching a cold so <laughs> a little bit of a cough <laughs> you so, you're uh, lucky <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're sitting in weather the weather is very nice cold, yeah, yeah yeah it's actually suddenly Definitely. cooled down so so kya kare so yeah. Yeah. Sir, ek, I have got only one question, and guys, after that, I'm going to land up with you guys for questions. There are about close to 200 people watching us right now, uh, so you. please send in your questions. Uh, sir, my main question is about hypersonics. Now, hypersonic has been a technology which 
is the taste of the season right now with the Kinzals KH 31s being fired by the Russians pretty I mean devastatingly uh what do you think is the main purpose behind these uh, uh the the kind of tech that you're working on for hypersonics because it doesn't sure doesn't seem like a battlefield weapon it sure doesn't seem like a weapon that you would want to hit a very large target or anything like that because it doesn't carry that much weight what is the purpose for this particular weapon particular technology that everybody seems to be running behind and what is india where are we right now in terms of hypersonics okay yeah uh, very pertinent you know what happens is this uh, hypersonics if you talk loosely it's a new iphone on the block you know everyone wants to have it iran also says i have got hypersonic missiles okay i i think iran it it was latest just in the news about a week back that iran has demonstrated yeah, yeah. hypersonic missile i think that must be quid pro quo from russia for shahed the uh, drones and they have transferred uh, technology to that now see kinzel missile okay what is kinzel again uh, it's not classically a hypersonic missile it's an aero uh, ballistic missile okay it is it is the iskander missile which was the ground version carried in the aircraft what is iskander missile it had a 500 kilometers of range so now when you say kinzel is 2000 kilometers of range probably they are including aircraft range uh, along with it you know where it is uh, taking it it's not a new missile okay and it had optical seeker which gives it the like i said the final precision uh, capability okay but otherwise it's a simply a ballistic missile has got like any other you know space shuttle was uh, hypersonic german v2 rockets were hypersonic much more than hypersonic hypersonic speed is not new just as a matter of interest your earth revolves around the sun at 108000 kilometers per hour i mean you know if you take it the circumference it goes in 365 days which is about 100 marks okay every satellite is at 2025 mark okay yeah, yeah. everything so what happens is speed in the uh, outer space or you know where it builds up speed is no big deal it 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 is it happens the problem or the question is how fast can it go in the atmosphere so classically i would put hypersonic in two categories hypersonic cruise missile or hypersonic glide vehicle you know these are the two things which are in the atmosphere they go between 30 to 50 kilometers you know hypersonic cruise missile needs a scramjet technology which is yet not developed scramjet is burning fuel at supersonic speeds okay to say that you lighting a matchstick in a hurricane this is the example which is quoted you know if you have to light a matchstick in hurricane that is what scramjet uh, technology is all about so you have a missile which you know goes at 30 to 50 kilometers and is powered powered by your initially rocket booster which takes it to about mark 3 uh, or mark 2 plus where ramjet kicks in which takes it to mark 5 then the scramjet kicks in and now it goes 800 to 1000 kilometers you need about 1000 seconds of scramjet operation which no country is close uh, by okay now what happens is the glide vehicle is the next option that means you take this glide vehicle uh, hgv what we call even uh, demonstration uh, india has demonstrated you know that H- hstdv okay and df17 also carries of china glide vehicle now what happens is you take it up you know uh, uh, in the outer space build up speed and release this vehicle what, what how is this different because it enters the atmosphere most of the distance it covers in the lower atmosphere that is what 30 odd kilometers so it is difficult to detect till quite late imagine a ballistic missile you know which is coming at you from 150 kilometers you could see it from very very far so you can go and intercept but at 30 kilometers your radar detection line of sight is not uh, very far very far in absolute terms yes but when you divide it by the speed it is flying at it's not giving you that much time speed is important so why two things it combines you know it combines speed with late detection so it reduces your ooda loop ooda is observe orient detect and act okay that means i observe something i orient myself that what is happening and now you know i uh, decide not detect sorry decide i decide what is to be done okay and now i act that what is to be done so this is a decision taking loop okay decision making loop these kind of weapons shorten this you know uh, loop 
But now the question is the ranges that we are talking of 500 to 1000 kilometers, the uh, Brahmos take a case, you know, it, uh, or any other normal prelim design, okay, will strike at uh, Mark 2 and something strikes at Mark 5. You are halving the time, correct? So 15 minutes instead of warning, you know, you will get seven minutes warning, which may not appear so much, but with the kind of decision making and things, you know, the way they happen in war time, seven minutes actually could be a very, very uh, long time. So this is what we are, they are planning to uh, shrink that, you know, and they can maneuver because they're in the atmosphere, you know, they're producing lift. A hypersonic glide vehicle has a decent lift to uh, drag ratio, L by D ratio, what we call. So it can go very far based. It's, it starts producing lift. You know, see, normal missile stays by moving very fast and with some control surfaces, you know, which keep them afloat. But if you have a good lifting capability, then you can, you know, stay afloat uh, for a very long time. So it can cover very large distances at high speed uh, without, uh, uh, in the lower atmosphere. So it delays detection and then it can maneuver again, not maneuver, with, uh, you know, by chasing a target or with respect to a threat. It is not, sometimes we may be uh, uh, misguided that, you know, it can maneuver to avoid or somewhere. I Even when I searched, it is quoted that it can avoid, air, you know, air defense. I don't think they can avoid air defense uh, uh, missiles. All that they can do is they can change course or this thing uh, occasionally in the uh, in the uh, pre-programmed manner. So I presume I do my calculation that okay, when I launch this uh, missile, um, when is it likely to uh, you know uh, when is enemy likely to react? Uh, how will it react? Where will it? Uh, it's uh, you know uh, where is it? Uh, Air defense located, where will it come, where it's likely intercept is taking place. So I pre-program those maneuvers and I say, no, here it will divert here, it will, it will climb up again, it will descend again. And a glide vehicle actually can use the hopping technology, you know, technique. It can go up and little down. So like that, they can extend uh, range uh, also. And hypersonic missiles also, you know, uh, while we say hypersonic qualifies for Mark plus five plus uh, category in the terminal stage when they come to lower atmosphere no missile in my opinion will stay at uh, those mark numbers it's not possible if you go to the equation of kinetic heating and all they the temperatures are just far uh, too many okay now same thing happens with ballistic missile re-entry the temperatures that come up are 2000 3000 degrees celsius okay the difference is that in ballistic missiles, it happens for a moment. You know, time is of essence. That means the materials we are talking of, you know, hypersonic missile, you said another difference is that how materials can sustain those temperatures. So in a ballistic missile, I can have an ablative material, you know, which takes on all the heat and uh, then uh, goes off. But a hypersonic missile will have to sustain those temperatures through and through. Its material it is made of, its engine it's uh, made of, will have to sustain that heat for a long time. And the difference is, you, we all use microwaves, right? 200 degrees uh, heated up microwave. You can put your hand in and take out. But you can't keep it in for 10 minutes. You'll get roasted. You know, that is the difference. Or, or you would have seen that uh, uh, mystic Baba's, you know, walking on coal. You know, he can quickly walk on coal, okay? But you ask him to stand there for 10 seconds, he'll burn off, okay? It is that the exposure time is much less in those missiles, but in hypersonic missiles, it is, uh, you know, hell of a lot. But coming to their applicability, what is, uh, you know, how they are useful, they will be useful on these accounts that one, they are flying low, detection will be delayed, they are flying faster. They will uh, reach the target uh, quicker, and they can be. They can have these terminal guidance kind of uh, equipment, uh, which will take them to more uh, precise. Because you definitely will not have hypersonic missiles costing millions of dollars and then not reaching target the way you want. Mm. So that that is uh, that is a, a bit of myth about uh, hypersonic missiles. You know, anything that flies above Mark Five, we term it at hypersonic. But there is a, a huge difference between actual hypersonic technology and what is touted as hypersonic. So, interesting. Ho hope very, that answers your question. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So it's very very interesting because I mean I always also uh, to just to add the kinetic energy of that entire thing 
hitting something would be also quite a uh, let's say even at mark 3 mark 4 if it comes down and oh, yes. hit something oh bloody it's going to yes. open things rip open thing more most of them you know utilize this kinetic energy to uh, hit as they a, do have a small yes. warhead as a initial penetrator so that you know uh, it goes in but that kinetic energy is very very uh, important yeah because this uh, kinzel missile strike happened on the ukrainian command center uh, and it seems the chief general of uh, ukrainian army was injured and he's been pretty badly off since then so this was a command center hit which was underground underground yes and it went through a building underground and then exploded so that was that would have been a very very massive amount of kinetic energy oh yes they can, they can penetrate you know they are all designed for that it depends what kind of warhead uh, it's using you know uh, uh, the penetrative warhead or blast fragmentation depending on what yeah, kind yeah. of target it is but up to 5000 psi of hardened uh, structure you know they penetrate by almost 2 3 meters so you can imagine a normal and then blast you know it, it uh, like brahmos it has got a penetrator in front you know which there after the missile bore had detonates after about 10 milliseconds which at that speed takes it about uh, you know 6 meters deep, you know or uh, in a soft ground even worse yeah let's get into some questions sir uh, guys before yes, i do like like the video subscribe spread the word share it with your friends i think we should be hitting about with all your support and following we are going to be closing in by 23000 subscribers hopefully by tonight uh, just about i think 21 subscribers are left so thanks so much all of you guys for <laughs> joining in you can contribute to the dev talks efforts by scanning the qr code right above or becoming a member or sending us a super sticker or super chat thank you mr prabhakar for becoming a member of the channel thanks to have you with us uh shitik asked the first question why don't we have such a specialized armed of forces what is lack was it lack of foresight or red tape that prevented us also theater commands have been in discussion but air force has reservations why this air force reservations we've discussed already sir we've we've actually taken it up but yeah never you... mind uh, uh, fair enough i think these are genuine doubts uh, people have now uh, let me see why don't we have such specialized armed or forces i think uh, briefly i covered that you know are probably a uh, threat appreciation and our uh, aspiration that that time were little different we were probably more pakistan centric and you know without getting into too much details we actually our uh, scheme of things did not cater too much for uh, china's threat you know for quite some time i thought that we thought that you know pakistan was the main uh, threat it is uh, subsequently it started emerging as a uh, major thing so uh, uh, i don't know red tape is a uh, foresight uh, from that point of view yes we one can say that you know one should have uh, you have a neighbor very big and you know how could you be so sure that it will not start troubling you at some point of time uh, we should have been prepared but then uh, you know we had lot of uh, other issues i guess uh, you know how much could be spared to develop armed forces how much could be spent on armed forces Uh, recently you know uh, relatively uh, independent guns, uh, guns of, uh, yeah absolutely so uh, that is why you know that debate incidentally still carries on when you enter the space uh, when you talk of space you know we are making strides in space i uh, came across a tweet uh, somewhere that what's the point of finding water on mars when you know people are dying of thirst now this is a perception right so uh, the government has to cater for uh, everything okay so i think what was spent on defense uh, i would uh, not uh, make an unfair judgment probably best uh, would have been done red tape uh, is again become uh, a kind of norm saying that uh, whatever doesn't happen quickly uh, we don't know the underlying uh, reasons that why is it taking time maybe the cases are not proper maybe the questions are being asked maybe etc etc so any delay we feel uh, is uh, uh, red uh, tapeism Uh, as far as theater command is concerned you know air force had uh, not reservation from um, the theater command per se i think it had reservation on the structure of it you know that the way it was being uh, uh, covered or way it was being perceived you know dividing air force assets 
we already know that we didn't have enough assets you know not enough uh, aircraft dedicated for air defense or strike there are multi role aircraft how are you going to divide it you know into different uh, theaters etc uh, etc et so all this uh, were the issues so reservations were mostly on the structure part of it not really uh, i would say i mean that it was not one arm uh, against the other it, it was more of a healthy discussion and government is taking uh, care of it i suppose interesting so uh, you know it's it's uh, it's an interesting paradigm actually when when we see this entire game so uh, but should india build a rocket force even when even though they are not accurate but they may deter the enemies by india is not building a 1000 km we have 1000 km range icbms we already have them uh, 1000 why our icbm nuclear submarine program is going slow see i think uh, the first part of the question is a little better than the rest sir. yeah yeah so no we already have the agni class missile covers for it it is just that it is not for conventional uh, uh, warhead so tomorrow the we decide that okay some agni missiles will have conventional uh, warheads you already have an icbm more than 1000 kilometers uh, reach okay so that's not uh, the that technology is not an issue it is just question of uh, you know thinking uh, about it that we need it and uh, um, uh, pralaya missile currently yes uh, it's a short range uh, uh, ballistic missile you increase its range tomorrow uh, it, it will come into that uh, category but again a caution you know yes we can build numbers uh, uh, no doubt about it but everything comes at a cost you know you have to see that what is more important is it more important to have more brahmos class of missiles you know build uh, uh, in house you know i believe there is lot of talk on now uh, the brahmos just uh, celebrated 25 years of uh, uh, you know their being in india and a lot of technology transfer will take place they've already said that uh, uh, this can happen so the point is i i would still say yes we can build more missiles as a uh, showcase that we have more number of missiles and we launch them anywhere uh, like london bombing but uh, if you have to have uh, meaningful deterrence i think you know as a professional force i think the accuracy or the precision part of it should not be lost sight of otherwise you see if you don't stay focused on this people or you know the guys will produce just about anything now defense is opening up to uh, civil you know if i i am a civil manufacturer you know tomorrow uh, abhi currently it's only defense psus or drdo who's making it who knows tomorrow like lockheed martin you know anywhere tatas could be making it reliance could be making it you know adani is could be making it they uh, they've all you know gone into different defense so if the focus is not there on precision then it's a probably easy one technology just keep producing missiles uh, of that range you know all you have to do is put in some rocket uh, as much boost and it will keep going further and further so i think we we need to uh, just stay uh, keep the focus on precision so that when people develop long ranges or something uh, uh, that part is not uh, lost sight of uh, i mean that's my personal opinion uh, i would say Naveen also won't uh, this maneuverability in ballistic missiles add more error and increase the CEP? No, 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 no. It is pre-planned. It is not ad hoc. Okay. See what happens is everything is worked backward. So earlier, what happens is it is not that it is uh, just changing course uh, at its will. Okay. So I will. I know where is it going to maneuver? How much is it going to maneuver? And the it is launched and programmed accordingly. So it will go and hit the designated target, like it would have done without uh, maneuvering. You know, maneuverable re-entry vehicle. When you, we talk, they just enter and you know change course, which is pre-planned. That's what I'm saying. It is. Uh, I know how is it going to maneuver, and as per that, I launch it by working backwards. that uh, uh, you know if it has to hit target and these are the maneuvers uh, uh, it is going to undertake then this is how it needs to be launched so that trajectory is planned uh, according so it, it will not uh, uh, change its cp it will only make it unpredictable to a defense uh, so any hints of developing larger range 12000 kilometers 
Oh, there is a, there is, I mean, I believe there is a Surya missile, you know, uh, yes, which sir. is there 16,000 kilometers uh, range. Okay. There is a Shorya hypersonic also, but I don't know much about it. But I did not. One thing that this is, this is very funny to me. If we can send something into space, you can drop a missile anywhere in the world if you want. Precisely. Because no. The yeah, amount of I, energy that it needs to go into space, the earth turns around, you can bring it down anywhere you want after that. Yeah. So there, there are little differences, you know, like I said, uh, launching something into space, which you are not planning to recover is a different issue. Okay. Yes. Satellite, you're not planning to recover. It can burn off, you know, it, it can uh, re-entry and even uh, the, you know, you, when you have to recover something, then you need yes. a space shuttle kind yes. of, tip. there is a difference. So that is a difference yes. between launching a satellite and, you know, like our yes. startups are launching satellites. You yeah, know, yeah. nano satellites, but they can't make nano ballistic missiles, you know, because it's it's a the re entry is the main uh, issue. The main technology of your material science, you know, which is holding us back, you know, why, for example, I'm saying you, you have the material for Agni, for example, or you know, the, which can uh, enter the atmosphere and withstand 3000 degree uh, Fahrenheit or Kelvin temperature. Uh, why can't it sustain 2000 uh, degree temperature in a jet engine? We don't have material for jet engine. You know, LCA is falling short. <laughs> what I explained because of material, you know, the, the time, the uh, time factor comes in and yeah. that material science metallurgy comes in. Okay. Yeah. So it yeah. is the re-entry, which is the, which is of uh, essence. Biggest answer. Arpita asks, uh, uh, deterrence will need to convince China. It's just an interesting comment. Uh, we'll need to uh, convince China that Agni can reach the CCP headquarters in Beijing. How can cruise missiles be a deterrent unless Be Beijing feels threatened? This oh, is a big course. question. So if I may just add an addendum, you know, a lot of people think having a big missile force is, you know, when you launch a rocket, you have no idea whether that rocket is carrying a conventional weapon or a nuclear one. You're not going to call your enemy and say, bye, hello, I have a weapon, it's not nuclear, so put a nuclear one. <laughs> You can't do that. It's, 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 you can't do that. I, I think that that is behind the philosophy of China keeping it mixed. Even though they have NFU, the, their command and control of nuclear missile and conventional missiles is not uh, separate. So uh, you will not know what missile, I mean, especially for USA, I get, though it has NFU, but you know, every country will play by the ear, you know, how badly it is being pushed into something, whether it takes that option or not. Okay. So uh, you will have to be careful. For example, in uh, Gulf War, you know, that uh, scuds, for example, every scud was intercepted and by patriots and they say uh, that every every interception of the scud missile created more damage on ground rather than if missile had come and hit you know but why did they have to intercept every missile because they were not sure what kind of warhead is it carrying you know they were bothered about chemical warhead biological warhead etc etc okay so they had to do that their confusion was always uh, there now the China will definitely feel threatened. You know, that is why the integrated rocket force has been announced. Uh, cruise missile, you know, when we say it can uh, reach large ranges, we are saying 1500 kilometers, it can go to 2000 kilometers, uh, also depending on how much fuel uh, it can go. Yes, there is a chance that since it, they are mostly subsonic, unless uh, Brahmos comes up, uh, you know, with supersonic, that their interception probability uh, is high. But, you know, the effort will be on that once India has declared that it is developing a rocket force, then I'm sure it will become a, a very, very important or important ingredient of that force, you know, because unless you can threaten absolutely, I mean, brilliant uh, question, I would say that unless you can threaten somebody's very existence, uh, it is no deterrence. So we will sure have that capability, uh, I suppose, when, once we have started looking uh, in this direction. Can the S-400 system act on all types of missiles that you described, sir? Yes, it can It can uh, act on any missile. You know, like I said, it just positions itself in the path of the missile, okay? the Any kind of ballistic missile defense. But, you know, any point defense system like this S-400 or Patriot, you must understand, it can defend uh, a, a very uh, uh, focused area. You know, it is deployed where it is likely to be where you're defending the thing. It, it is not like your standard 
the equation is not the same as between surface to air missile and an aircraft you get my point take a case uh, let me give a broad uh, example of delhi agra okay everyone knows these places so if a uh, you know aircraft was heading uh, towards delhi or going towards bombay and you have an air defense system at agra which is uh, you know uh, off the scene you can probably launch a surface to air missile and intercept an aircraft even which is not coming directly at agra okay broad analogy i mean don't take it literally right oh in uh, actual scenario these places would be close by and let me translate it into our fighter bases like you know adampur and halwara okay a mm. target see aircraft coming at halwara can be intercepted with an uh, surface to air missile deployed at adampur also okay or ambala also but same is the nature not the case with the, these kind of things you know the the trajectories are so precise like i said intercept the incoming missile by coming in its way so uh, maneuverability is not much that is why the advantage over this maneuverability of that incoming missile in between that if you can predict its trajectory very very uh, correctly now uh, also you know it is uh, uh, if you google and uh, see the difference between pad prithvi air defense system and the being developed ad it will tell you that pad could intercept a missile at 80 kilometers and ad can intercept at 30 kilometers now one may wonder on reading it because 80 kilometers appears more safe you know farther and that what is advanced ad which uh, in fact intercepts missiles at closer uh, range 30 kilometers how is it advanced common sense would dictate that instead of 80 kilometers i should be able to intercept at 200 kilometers that is an advancement not lowering the range you get my point but the point is that i i can i need to wait now that okay earlier if i could trigger off my air defense system at 200 kilometers range of you know or more that uh, let me come back to that track of uh, you know 400 meters mm-hmm. you have to intercept an athlete on that 400 meters track now i moment i detected or i came to know by any means you know there are ways to know when a missile has been launched okay Uh, by radars or by satellites moment i knew that this missile has been launched this trajectory is predicted i could uh, use my uh, you know air defense weapon to position uh, in its way and it intercepted at let's say 80 kilometers but now yeah. what happened is i am not sure uh, what is going to happen at 200 kilometers now at 200 kilometers when the athlete changes track now i have to launch the missile then now will that my earlier missile will have the capability to wait that long and still intercept it you know in between that is the advancement so that i can still launch a missile and intercept a missile which could have maneuvered at probably a closer range even at 30 kilometers which from the point of view of damage to my uh, target is still safe enough you know 30 kilometers is i mean cement by mathematically figures that is lower than 80 but uh, mm-hmm. from safety point of view it is it is decent you know it's, decent, it's so. not a problem yeah hmm. this is an interesting question uh, drones or rockets are effective i am i think he she was, was trying to write effective effective in mountain terrain sir drones and rockets i don't know from which point of view but uh, drones and rockets uh, will be effective in any terrain now what kind of drones you know drones have uh, drones is a different uh, chapter uh, altogether okay are they guided drones are they working on line of sight if you talk of our current inventory then probably not because they depend on line of sight you know you need an operator to control them you you need uh, uh, you know uh, uninterrupted signal between drone and the ground controller but if you talk of satcom connectivity then definitely not they can go anywhere because they are talking to satellite now unless i mean you have a mountain higher than the satellite i just on the lighter side <laughs> but uh, the otherwise they will be effective you know they just have they are yeah. communicating with the satellite what was the other thing drone and rockets rockets, rockets again uh, rockets means they are coming from all of them are coming from way high they can you know they are all striking at 80 degrees uh, trajectory you know that uh, other than cruise missile or brahmos you know which can strike flat okay the all these ballistic missiles will come hurtling down from uh, up uh, in the sky at almost 80 85 degrees uh, trajectory so mountains or hills or no they just need to uh, know the target yes point of interest could be the uh, exact location or 
coordinates of the target you know like we said if it is a mountainous terrain something you want to hit a peak particular peak then probably it's not the right weapon for that it it obviously is a little bit of area uh, you know it will need to be effective and the last one sir we will take we are at about 1 hour and 10 minutes so we'll take the last question uh, yeah. for years engineering colleges had computer science as the flagship discipline with an emerging focus on defense manufacturing and semiconductor shouldn't there be a renewed focus on manufacturing related disciples and navin thank you so much for your contribution you know absolutely you uh, i i couldn't uh, you know agree uh, with navin more because what happens is there are certain uh, cliche disciplines you know that uh, uh, something like in our times you remember uh, doctors and engineers was the only two uh, disciplines you know then the things uh, weighed out and uh, now when you come to uh, uh, this technology computer science uh, uh, is definitely uh, very very uh, famous but we need to increase discipline you know what what we call this uh, stem science technology engineering and mathematics okay that that uh, needs to be uh, progress not only in that in the spheres where you know is saying i would say even space you know for example or uh, in uh, you know everything will get covered you need to start Uh, people's interest from the very beginning from the schools i would go a step further you know you need to nurture people uh, from the very beginning and uh, that he gets his orientation that he has to work towards this what we do is we are multidisciplinary from the beginning because you are not sure which field will you ultimately get into where is going to be more you know uh, lucrative things and uh, uh, you know interest is there i agree but interest has to be nurtured also you know it is not everybody otherwise follows the mean free path you know easy path i today i am interested in this thing i find it a little difficult i leave it i said no no i don't think i was interested in so i am interested mm. in that mm. okay mm. because everywhere there is a little bit of moment they say profession becomes i mean hobby becomes profession it's not the same okay you will start losing interest because now it's real hard work it's uh, you know just not simple passion so the disciplines that he is talking of must be uh, you know Uh, identified people encouraged and nurtured uh, to follow uh, these kind of uh, disciplines for which you know your educational institutes have to find it uh, lucrative to train you know it's a in complete ecosystem industry has to grow has to demand these disciplines and only then will the educational institutions will find it lucrative to train people you know in in our system are we still in india i have seen everything has to be converted monetarily nothing happens for pure passion because ultimately it's livelihood for everybody it's not Absolutely. like america where you know people are uh, uh, i couldn't care less whether i get a job or not you know state looks after me and i totally get into my passion and you know get into just about anything okay here people have it at the back of mind that you know you have to do some job a job is must i mean it's amazing that all our star athletes also are doing some kind of job you know either someone is a police inspector in bsf or on railways or this thing etc a job is important okay even whatever you might be doing so now what happens is in this kind of disciplines if the government uh, definitely has to you know uh, pay focus incentivize it build it up yes yeah. that yes this is this is required you know we we need to uh, and the success rate in innovations is very low you know you cannot convert 90% of uh, innovation or you know research into a visible product you know if the failures are many this uh, telescope you know uh, you reach uh, you read how the developments took place you will find hundreds and thousands of uh, failure points okay we saw uh, elon musk launching that uh, starship kind of thing and it fails you laugh it off okay that virgin atlantic dropping uh, you know not trying to launch a satellite fails it's uh, even now these things happen right yeah so the point is that this is very important that uh, uh, we identify these niche disciplines they may not appear lucrative to begin with they may not be very very uh, ready uh, market for home grown uh, you know education but ultimately i think this is the future i hope we start future. with mm. yeah. just another short comment before we close up yeah, yeah please yeah uh, 
he says uh, thanks Naveen he says futuristic question do you foresee rockets being housed in space like superhero movies man don't give Chinese ideas buddy <laughs> you know uh, and do you foresee rockets being uh, housed in the space oh uh, we are, I mean you know weaponization of space if you talk it's a different thing let short question short answer to short question you know we may brush it under the carpet it today is- Today we are, you know, uh, and let me tell you that uh, uh, whether there will be weapons in the space or not, uh, Earth is also part of space. Are there weapons on Earth? There are weapons on Earth. Why are there weapons on Earth? You see, in the space now, everybody is exploring uh, resources. You know, they are interested in asteroids, okay, Uh, that asteroids should not hit the Earth. Okay, that is the that is the facade. Okay, but I'm sure yeah, they are yeah. interested in mining. Okay, the uh, there is a very funny. I mean, I would call it funny because it sounds so. There is an American uh, strategist who has warned uh, people that be sure when China goes and explores moon, it is possible that he puts his people and say this part of moon is mine. Okay, so uh, uh, but it is on record. I mean, it is there uh, in the uh, public domain. So what happens is moment people start finding resources in space. Now, what will they do resources in space? Life is still a long, long way, you know, at those planets. So they might have to transport those resources into Earth. Who guards the resources? I think only military can guard the resources and military cannot do it without weapons. You know, the moment tomorrow you start finding resources, they will need to be guarded. And this is something which is staring you in the face. That is why so much is being written on responsible behavior in space. But I think these advanced nations uh, are still uh, speculating that who does it first. So somebody will do it first. If America does it first, it will quickly have its domain and then bring out some rules and regulations for the rest of the world to follow that, you know, don't do it. Okay. Rules-based okay. international, no, rules, rule-based yeah. spatial order. Spatial order, <laughs> yes. So something like that. Oh, Sir, I hope that thank you so much. Question. Yeah. 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 This was this was a fantastic show. Thank you so much, and uh, you know uh, the understanding of and I, I I I stand by my point. I mean, I personally feel that this is one of the biggest threats that the Chinese pose to us in times of war. This is the most credible threat. I I you know the Air Force has issues, Chinese Navy has issues, and this and that. We know those things, but uh, not much of issues, not much much of uh, finger pointing has been done on towards their rocket forces and we know their capabilities in space they've been sending stuff up and you know uh, they've got a space station going around there they've got multiple they've got the largest amount of uh, satellites that's one place that i see that yes they've actually made uh commendable advancements especially in terms of uh, military as well thank you for bringing that out and helping us to understand and also telling us that we are not far behind. We've got good technology. We just need to... Our head is also focused actually in this rocketry. I think we are doing decently well. But a little more chabi needs to be done. A little more tightening needs to be done so that we achieve what we are wanting to achieve. Sir, thank you so much. Always a pleasure interacting with you and learning about a very interesting subject. Till next time, sir. Thank you so much, Adi. I always uh, enjoy interacting with you and especially your audience. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.